But okay. can we stay on topic a little bit, Tim? I mean, well, are you going to tell parents the that their kids can go to school worked. if they say no to the COVID-19 vaccine? Are you or not? The misunderstanding with the job of governor is so apparent. I, can, you, can I give him some more time on this? Because I think Minnesotans be very clear on this. There's a process that will come. Wow, wow, wow. An extraordinary moment of the gubernatorial debate in the state of Minnesota, where, well, you saw arrogance on display by the incumbent Democrat there, didn't you, the governor? And a very simple question posed by the Republican challenger, Dr. Scott Jensen, who joins us now. I mean, Dr. I <coughs> This is what you're dealing with in Minnesota, this kind of attitude? It was a simple question. Are, are you going to mandate the vaccine for children going to public schools? Did he ever give you an answer? No, he never did. He was never clear on this. And he said that I didn't understand the role of the governor, and that was a problem. So I think that Minnesota parents have to wonder, would Tim Walls mandate their kids get a COVID vaccine in order for them to be able to attend school? Yeah, it's that simple. And Dr. Jensen, I understanding the role of governor. I think, sadly, after the pandemic, Americans now all too well understand the role of the governor. They declare an emergency and they pretty much can do whatever they want. And I know that the, the people of Minnesota suffered just as much as the rest of us. Is that what motivated you to run for office? Absolutely. I was done with serving in the politics. I felt like I had done my time. I had done 10 years on the school board. I'd done a term in the Senate. Uh, my wife had some health issues. But when COVID hit, I saw the lockdowns. I saw the elderly, frail nursing home patients being locked in and made to die alone. I saw kids locked out of school. I saw government policies being capricious and, if you will, at times audacious in their scope. I said, this can't happen. And people started to push me hard. So, yeah, we made the decision to run and uh, we are absolutely all in. Uh, the last poll, the Trafalgar poll, showed us a a half a point up, and I think Minnesotans are absolutely engaged in saying we've had enough. Yeah, yeah listen, that's why you're here, sir. I'll be honest with you. Uh, several days before a midterm election, uh, we'd be focusing on a lot of different races. But generally speaking, the governor's race in Minnesota wouldn't be on the radar because, I mean, Minnesota, other than Tim Pawlenty, I suppose, there hasn't been a great track record for Republicans running for office. But, but look at the polls now. What are you hearing from voters that uh, sort of tell the tale as to why you are now within striking distance of Victory Tuesday? I think the big issues in Minnesota are clearly inflation, crime, and education. I think voters, for the most part, are absolutely horrified as to what happened in Minnesota education. That the national report card came out last week, and they're recognizing that Minnesota was devastated under Tim Walz's policies. But I think the other thing that's really bubbling up is the crime. Tim Walz is trying to put himself out there as someone who's pro police, when the fact is he quit on the National Guard, he quit on the cops, he quit on the state patrol, he quit on the kids, he locked them down. But I think on the crime thing, people are recognizing the Department of Corrections has been releasing repeat felons back into the community, and these felons have committed murder. CARE 11, a uh, worthy news station in Minnesota, came out recently and had 16 different murders that were alleged to have occurred by people that should have been behind bars. I think Minnesotans are really starting to get a clear picture that Tim Walls is going to do more to, if you will, gain favor with his hard left base than he is to stop crime. Yeah, and let's talk about this a little bit further because I was so heartbroken after the George Floyd incident, the murder of George Floyd, where Minnesota became sort of ground zero of this defund the police movement because there was a window of time there. I interviewed so many law enforcement officials. I interviewed so many Republican mayors and governors and district attorneys. There was unanimity here. Clearly a crime was committed here with the murder of George Floyd. This was a moment in time, sir, when we could have actually come together and we could have actually said, yes, this was wrong, but we don't throw everything we've learned about law enforcement out the window and hand the streets over to a criminal element. Instead, sadly, your governor and so many other Democrats, your attorney general, Keith Ellison, who is now uh, on the downside of the latest polls in your state, they went in the other direction. They decided, OK, that's it. We'll buy into the defund the police thing. How has this affected crime specific directly in your state since that happened? 
I think it earned Tim Walls the uh, the moniker Godfather of the Crime Epidemic. <laughs> Tim Walls also went out and endorsed completely Ilhan Omar. And Omar, two weeks after the riots and the devastation in the streets of Minneapolis, Omar came out and said the police were a cancer that needed to be defunded and dismantled. And a few weeks after that, Tim Walls came out and told Minnesotans that Ilhan Omar was the woman that Minnesotans needed to get behind and support and have represent us in Congress. Tim Walls has been no friend of the police, but now that we're into this election cycle, he's trying to flip flop and say, hey, I've always been with the police. He has not been. That's why the Minnesota Police and Peace Officer Association honestly endorsed uh, the Jensen campaign uh, just a few weeks ago. They understand clearly that whether you're talking Tim Walls, whether you're talking about his Department of Corrections, his Sentencing Commission, at every level, Tim Walls has been soft on crime, and the criminals love him. <laughs> you know, whenever you look at Minnesota, you know, listen, you guys, God bless you, in 1984, you were the only state that didn't go for Ronald Reagan. I mean, there, there, there is sort of this, this renegade pushback against Republican politics that you often see at the statewide level. But when you drill down and look at how the map goes county by county, you've got Minneapolis, St. Paul looking pretty Democrat, but boy, the rest of that state is incredibly conservative. Is this really right now your challenge is really just to get out the vote challenge for all of those people who don't feel like they're represented anymore in the Capitol? Absolutely it is. But also the, the other thing that we're seeing is we are seeing moms and dads lead the way on issues of education and crime. We're seeing minorities say, we're not buying what they're selling anymore. This bill of goods that they've offered to us isn't what they said it would be. And we're also seeing millennials and Gen Z starting to understand that this is a serious situation. In 2010, our national debt was $10 trillion. Now, 12 years later, it's $30 trillion. I think we have an awful lot of millennials and Gen Z saying that these liberal policies aren't working and we're not going to stay on the same path we've been. So between the minorities, the millennials and Gen Zs, the moms and the dads, we see a path forward to victory without question. Well, and let's face it, it was minority businesses and minority homes that were devastated and burned in those riots and the governor stood back and let it happen. Uh, this is it was it was a crime against the people of Minnesota. Uh, before we run out of time, I want to hear your website so that everybody watching can uh, help push you over the top here for the election Tuesday. Where where can they go to support you? Our website is drscottjensen.com, D-R-S-C-O-T-T-J-E-N-S-E-N.com. And we absolutely could use the support both in messaging and encouragement, but also if there's any opportunity to do some fundraising and if people are willing to donate, Tim Walls has raised about twice what wow. we've done by any governor uh, candidate in the history of the Republican Party. Uh, and really quickly, you, you did serve in the state Senate for a brief time, um, and uh, the, now you've decided to come back in the fray. I, I'm wondering, uh, what's, what's the future looking like for you right now? Because, listen, you had your nice practice, you were a doctor, you served in the state Senate, but you were so compelled to come back in to, to run this race as the governor. Um, are, are you ready to embrace this new challenge? Because it's not for everyone. I absolutely am. I am certainly not looking for a new career path. I'm 60 years old. I consider myself a first and foremost family doctor. But the words of Esther 414 say, have you considered you're in the position you're in for such a time as this? And I think a lot of Americans are recognizing this across the nation. We don't get to stand on the sidelines. America's bleeding. She's calling for help. It's up to us to get off the sidelines, do the Teddy Roosevelt thing, get in the arena, take the slings and arrows, get bruised and bloodied. But by George, this is our time. This is our moment. We've got to step in, help America. We'll let that be the last word. Uh, Dr. Scott Jensen, uh, good luck with the race. Uh, we'll be watching you Tuesday night with our full coverage here on Salem News Channel. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. Good luck to you. In fact, let's go out with one more clip from that debate so you see exactly what Dr. Scott Jensen's all about. More to come on O'Connor tonight. We spend more per student than any of the other neighboring Midwestern states. At some point in time, we're going to have to ask the question, are we getting what we're paying for? We need to start funding kids, not broken institutions.